Hey, welcome to Rad Talk MBA by Magoosh. This is where we chat with uh, real admissions officers, MBA students, and alums getting the full scoop on getting in and getting through business school, among other things. Do you want to get into a top program to succeed? What is business school really like? Hear about all of this and more in Grad Talk MBA. Bar in person, we get a lot of snacks. So we like <laughs> food. So we have food motivated people. Um, so I just remember like there used to be like five, six bags of popcorn and like, there'd be like pop tarts and like, you know, the most unhealthy snacks. But it helped us because we enjoyed it and we generally love working together as a team to craft a class. All right. Uh, excited to be here um, today on Grad Talk MBA by Magoosh. Uh, really excited to have uh, our guest today. Um, I'll let her introduce herself, but a longtime friend uh, and colleague, and and uh, we've been working together and um, partying a little bit together over the years, and excited just a little bit. Um, and just a really excited. Bit. No, to, no comment. <laughs> a little, 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 little teeny bit. Um, so really excited to have you on the podcast today, Danielle. And um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Eric Allen. I'm one of the uh, the general managers here at Magoosh. Um, we're an education tech company uh, leveling the playing field by providing high quality, affordable test prep and admission services. Um, and the point of this podcast is to demystify the MBA application process for our listeners. Um, so we're so excited to have you. So why don't you just start um, with your title, your role uh, at UNC? Yeah. Well, Eric, thank you so much for having me here. It's, as always, it's so nice to see you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Danielle Ritchie. I'm the director of full-time MBA admissions and student recruitment at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and Keaton Flagler Business School. Very long title, very long name, um, but it is a pleasure to be here. Thank you. All right. So how did you get into this? Um, like, Tell us a little bit about yourself. I think the first part we wanted to do was really learn a little bit about you and like how you got in this industry um, and a little bit about you, um, not too much, but just a little bit. <laughs> Enough to be dangerous. Um, yeah, so I fell into admissions. You know, you don't go to college for undergrad to be an admissions counselor. Um, it's a job that you just fall into. Um, and so I've been in the industry now for quite some time. I won't say how long, um, a specific number. I don't want to date myself, but I've been in MBA admissions specifically for over a decade. Um, love what I do, passionate about what I do. Um, I've been with the University of North Carolina for over five years. Um, prior to that, worked for two other institutions in the Northeast, but um, gosh, yeah, I, I think that, that my favorite thing about my role um, and what I do is cultivating relationships with candidates and being a resource for them. Um, a lot of people feel like, oh, it's a director, you know, it's the gatekeeper or, you know, can't talk to them. No, I, I really want to talk to you um, and really want to help people. And that's something that I thoroughly love most about, about this role. And um, I think for a lot of our candidates, like you saying that is really critical because like people don't know, like you're just a really kind person. And like, so people see, and maybe they're a little intimidated, but it's really nice for you to hear you say that. What about one fun fact? Like, what is something that makes you just a unique person? I, I know a few things, but like, what, do, yeah. what would you say a, a fun fact about yourself? Fun fact. So I think the one thing that came to mind, because you and I talk about it, because your daughters play soccer, is I'm a, a soccer referee, a U.S. soccer referee. So when I'm not reading applications, um, I'm out on the pitch. And it's amazing to be a part of. It's great to see so much young talent that's coming up. Um, and it's a great way for me to be out there with a, with a game that I appreciate and have loved for, for my whole life. That is true. And when we talked about this, I was instantly terrified because I'm like, have I ever yelled at you like <laughs> from the sideline? But I think we found out that I hadn't. Um, so that's you, a beautiful. You haven't yelled at me. Um, <laughs> people that have right. been I, yelled out, sure. have been yelled by me. They know they remember that. Ooh. Um so yeah, no no nonsense policy with me. <laughs> good, good. Well, I haven't been kicked out by you, so that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, okay, great. Look, well, let's let's pivot a little bit to the school. You know, the the question that I'm sure you get asked a lot is how is Keenan Flagler different than other schools? And I think that's something that our candidates see a lot of times. They come into this space and they're like, "Oh, I'm going to be able to tell," but it's not always obvious. So, how would you say um, Keenan Flagler really differentiates itself? Yeah, that's a great question and one that 
we get quite often um, because you can see things on the website. You can you know read things in a brochure, but it's one thing to actually go experience campus. And I say when people come to, to Caroline and to Chapel Hill, they fall in love with the, the culture, the environment of Keenan the Flagler. Our students are now, they're out there wanting to help people. Um, and so I think that's something that really people find, you know, you can't just pick up on, from reading on a, on a website. Um, and so we have a culture that we call it the Carolina way. And it's all about giving back to each other, helping each other. You know, we're known as the nice NBA. Um, and so our students aren't mad about that. They're like, no, we want to be the nice NBA. And when you think about top 20, you think about, oh gosh, it's going to be competitive. It's going to be, you know, sharp elbows. Our students are helping each other with interview prep. I, I remember a student who had no background in accounting and it was the accounting final. And two hours before that, there was another student who had experience in accounting. They stopped studying so that they could go help their classmate so that they could feel prepared for the exam. So I think that truly embodies who we are at Carolina. Um, the other thing too that is quite popular are sports. Um, you know, it's a large campus. Um, students that come from a smaller campus or smaller school, they really embrace that mentality of sports, camaraderie, um, the mascot, which is a ram, don't even get me started on that. Um, but there's a lot to embrace. And I think those are our differentiators for Carolina and our community um, as well. No, and thanks for that. And, and I think that was really helpful because those are things that you can't find on the website, right? Like mm -hmm. when we talk about MBA, obviously you're doing this for your career, but you also want to have a development process and to have your colleagues know that they have your back is a really awesome thing. Um, so let's let's switch gears away from the school to just the overall application process and kind of this is overwhelming for a lot of people. Um, and so you've obviously been in many of those decisions rooms. You're leading those decision discussions um, and there's a lot that goes on in there. So let's start with this. How much time would you recommend that applicants put aside to think through this process, to go through this process? Um, Let's start there and then we'll keep going down this path of application. Yeah. So I would say take your time. There's no, you know, you're going to be taking two years off from your career. So if you can take at least six months of actually preparing, if not longer, I'd say at minimum six months. Um, but sometimes there's things that can happen. You know, there's been a lot of layoffs and sometimes you have to pivot quickly. Um, and that's okay. It's really important that you're taking time to invest in yourself. This is going to be a self-awareness process. Um, it's not going to be, you know, get it done in one night and that's it. But it's something that you really need to think about. And I say at least six months of preparing, researching schools um, before e even hitting submit on your application. And in, in your experience, when you talk to applicants, um, both, you know, during, before and after the, the process, is there a an area where you would say they underestimate how long it's going to take to accomplish something or to get through something or to process something in the application? Yeah, I love that. Essay questions. Everyone thinks that they can sit down and, and just write it and, and be done within an hour. But again, you have to do a lot of self-reflection and you want to make sure that you're answering the prompt accordingly. Um, for each of the schools, because it's not just going to be a general statement that you have to reply with. So it's really important that you are taking the time to invest into writing each specific essay, because as an admissions committee member, we're going to see, are you following instructions? Are you answering the question that we, we want you to answer? Um, and is it genuine? Um, with all the resources like ChatGBT, all of that, yes, it's a, maybe a good resource, but that it doesn't tell the, the authentic authenticity of, of who you are. It doesn't tell your story. So I say definitely take time to write your essays and really invest in that process and be vulnerable with it too. Love that. Um, you mentioned chat GPT and, and there's a lot of um, new AI resources out there. I want to piggyback on that for a second. Have you started to see that come through in the application process? And how do you think these AI tools are going to impact how you think about the world and how applicants maybe go through the application process. 
Yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> so uh, we have seen a little bit of it, um, and again, we can pick up on that. Um, it's a robot that's writing your paper, so we're going to pick up that it's robot sounding because we're also going to compare that to your interview. Does it have a consistent voice? Um, does it have a consistent tone? So if they're going to be different, then that's going to be a huge red flag for the admissions committee. Now, we understand that there have been resources that have been available for years, like Grammarly, you know, that helps you write and craft your story. Microsoft Word tells you, you know, when something doesn't sound right. So there's been various forms of it, um, but not to this magnitude. But we have started seeing it. Um, and we have adapted our ways of reviewing applications and will be more so in this upcoming year um, as it becomes more and more popular. All right. Well, you heard it here first. They know um, when we you're know. using it. So be very, very careful with that applicant. You certainly don't want to put yourself at risk um, for even being questioned, to be honest. So thanks for that. Um, when you think about the elements of the application, we, we, we hear about this concept of holistic application, um, but there are different values and different usages for like different pieces of the application. What do you feel like if, if you were explaining this to an applicant, maybe some areas that are overvalued in the application and maybe some areas that are undervalued or people don't spend enough time, but should spend more time? Yeah, um, I think a lot of people focus on a test score. You know, I need to have the best test score, the highest GMAT or GRE. This is what I need to do to be successful in getting into the, the program. You're not a test score. Um, applicants are more than that because now more schools are offering test waivers. We're evaluating applications a little bit differently in terms of if there is no test score, what are we looking for? Um, I think, again, going back to essays, I think essays are undervalued in that people want to just hurry up get that done and really focus on their stats. Well, you can't change your GPA. That's always going to be what it is. Test scores, yes, you can change. But again, if you have an 800 and <clears throat> your interview falls flat, you may not be admitted into the program. So really thinking about a whole holistic of, of view is incredibly important um, for candidates when they are applying. So Again, not just a test score. Um, there are other ways that we can pick up on if you're quantitatively prepared for the rigors of an MBA program, but also your soft skills. Um, interviews are also very important, and I feel like sometimes they are undervalued. <clears throat> and this is that's not the case. It's something that we weigh heavily on because you can look great on paper, but it's one another thing if you can really bring your story to life. There's so many different things in this space around under resource and all that, but the reality is. Resourcing takes, you know, a very large definition of resourcing and backgrounds and people come from different mm -hmm. areas. But how would you recommend, um, because you have people who say could afford admissions coaches and people who can um, have different financial resources to be able to put to this application process. Clearly, it's not necessary in order to be successful. But for those who maybe come from under-resourced backgrounds, a lot of the clients that we serve here at Magoosh, we believe test prep should be affordable. What mm -hmm. kinds of things would you recommend for those who are preparing for the uh, process that maybe don't have as many resources as folks who could afford maybe some of those high-end test prep, high-end um, admissions consultants? Yeah, I would say you don't have to pay for for that to be successful. You know yourself best. Um, even people who pay that type of money, they're not all guaranteed admission into any program. So it's really important to use resources within your means. And there have been a lot of successful applicants that have done that before you. And so it's really important to focus on what can you afford, both from a financial standpoint, but also from a time standpoint too, um, into different things to help prepare you for um, the MBA application process. Uh, Magoosh is, is a great resource for, and I'm not just saying this because I'm on here, it's not, not being paid, um, or I'm not an influencer on this, but resources like this are fabulous to be a part of and to, to utilize. I would say stay away from forums because those are um, not paid people. Um, they are not admissions directors. They're not subject matter experts. And so that can cause a lot of 
unnecessary stress when you're on there and reading. And so I think if you go to the subject matter experts, free resources, or again, everyone has their own opinion about the, the cost of using somebody, but if there's free resources or resources that are um, within your budget, use them because it can be beneficial. You don't have to have somebody that is going to guarantee you admission to any program because they're not sitting in our seat. So you, they can't guarantee you anything. Yeah. And I, I, I appreciate you saying that. I, I think those forums can be dangerous. And I think just because you get into a program does not make you an expert on how to get into a program, right? Mm-hmm. I know that you, we've talked before, like sometimes people get in despite the things that they do. Um, and, um, and so therefore are not qualified to provide that type of guidance. So thanks for saying that. Let's, let's switch gears a little bit in terms of like some components of the application. Um, one of the areas that is, you know, when you think about chat GPT and all of the things you can influence these days, one of the things that's probably the the last thing to to be able to be influenced would be recommenders. So mm-hmm. I know that committees really do look at those um, for specific <clears throat> details. Um, what kind of advice do you have for choosing the best recommenders for a candidate as they're going through the MBA application process? Yeah, great. Another great question, one that we get quite often um, in admissions is who, who should I ask to be my recommender? First and foremost, who should not be a recommender is someone that you've never worked with. If you're going for the president of the company and you've never worked with them, it's going to show and it's going to put you in a bad light. So definitely work with somebody that knows you best. Obviously, mom, dad, a family member probably does, but they're probably not the best person to ask. So I would say think about from a professional standpoint, who in your life, maybe there's a mentor that you've had. Maybe there is a colleague who's been inspirational to you and has been a good support. Someone that knows you best is is the most important person to ask to write your recommendation because we're looking at that from a third-party perspective of how they think of you all. What is your potential? What are some of your strengths? What are some of your weaknesses? And weaknesses are okay. Everyone has them. We're not looking for you know, someone to be just so completely flawless and, and perfect. There is no perfect candidate. Um, so that's why it's really important to think about from a recommender standpoint, Maybe it could be, maybe you're an entrepreneur and there's a client. Ask them. Um, Again, someone that knows you best. Most importantly, just don't write the recommendation letter yourself. Um, We can pick up on that in admissions committee. There are different AI tools that we use um, to see, hey, did they submit from the same IP address? That can be concerning. Um, So definitely make sure that it's authentic and someone that knows you well um, and that can speak to, to you as a character um, and where you want to go with your career as well. When you think about recommender, um, recommendations rather, um, there's obviously cultural differences. There's um, differences across companies in terms of how um, people endorse other people. Maybe in certain industries, it's like they think this is a strong recommendation, but they're like, yes, this person is, I strongly recommend this person, but there's no fluff around it. Mm-hmm. Um, what kinds of things, given all of that, right? Like it makes your job challenging to, to say, is this a bad recommendation? Is it a lukewarm recommendation or is it cultural? Yeah. Um, and so what kinds of things do you look for in a recommendation that um, candidates can try to work around to prepare themselves uh, to get the best recommendations possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of schools lose, use the GMAT Common Letter recommendation form. We we do that at UNC, so it's important um, to give them that information up front so that they can be prepared. Um, but I always recommend reaching out to your recommender before they re- sit down and write that for you. Um, go over, you know, maybe they want your resume, maybe they want to sit down and interview, not say interview, but talk to you more about your goals. Um, examples, because that's going to be important to include in the letter of recommendation itself. We want that. We want those examples, just like in an interview, we're asking you questions. We want examples to be a part of that as well. Um, so reach out to your recommender with enough time, not just, hey, I'm, I'm submitting my application. would love for you to be a recommender. You're going to get the link in like 20 minutes. Be thoughtful and intentional about it um, because that's going to make them feel more welcomed and more responsive to submitting a letter of recommendation on your behalf. That's fabulous. Uh, thanks for that. So um, interviews, right? Obviously a huge piece at this point, you've already done 
um, an evaluation of the candidate. You you want to invite them to interview. They're coming in to interview. And it's really another opportunity for you to kind of check and see if there's alignment with what you've seen so far in the application. Yeah. What kinds of things do you suggest to help candidates stand out in the interview process? Yeah, be yourself, be authentic. Um, tell your story and bring that to life. You know, you're you're telling us a story, you're a story writer with your application, you're, you're writing out your essays, but now is an opportunity to really bring it to life and put a voice to it. And so being prepared with, with examples, a lot of the questions that candidates will get are behavioral. We want to get to know you more so as a person rather than just a piece of paper. Um, so really bringing your story to life, being real, I think is incredibly important as well in showing your personality. Because again, you're not just a test score. Some people think applicants in the past have thought, okay, I have a 750 GMAT, I'm automatically going to be admitted into the program. Well, their interview fell short, that was flat. They didn't know who they were. They didn't know what they wanted to do. They couldn't talk and tell their story. We've denied people because of that. So it's incredibly important to approach the interview being prepared and being prepared to talk about yourself and knowing who you are and what you want and what your values are. That's fabulous. Um, be yourself, like so important. It seems simple, but a lot of times this process, I feel like sometimes the process leads the person instead of the person leading the process, right? So exactly. um, re really great insight there. Exactly. All right, great. <laughs> so let's now switch gears a little bit to talk about inside the admissions committee. So that time when okay. you're... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, remember the sleepless nights, all that? We're, we're going back there. Um, so now you're you're kind of at the head of the table, so to speak, um, and really want to understand kind of what this process is like, because I think when we talk about demystifying the process, it's really about like, what is this process? So um, can you give us a peek into like what the admissions committee is like in your program? Even um, like who's involved in reading applications, how decisions are made. Is it a room? Is it virtual? Like, like I think we're just curious to know like what it's actually like. Yeah. I mean, I love that. I love that. And it's always like, do they sit behind closed doors and like have, you know, this angry music on and want to deny everybody? Or is it this nice peaceful environment where it's just, you know, unicorns and fluffiness and all of that. Um, it's always funny, but it's, it's the unknown and people are going to assume and think about different things. But for admissions committee, we, it's a lot of fun um, to be very honest with, with, with you. Um, we, there's a multi-step process um, when it comes to reviewing the application for UNC. We have at least three different people looking at your application, if not four or five. And so we're going to have different um, evaluations with different components of the application that are there for, for our readers. So like our reader one, they're not looking at your test scores. They don't even know if you have a test waiver or what score it is on your application. It is just generally getting to know you as an applicant. Then we have an interviewer who's going to be a different person that's evaluating the application. Um, and they're gonna have different components that they have access to. It's more than just a resume. It's not a blind interview process, but they're gonna be looking at your essays. They'll look at your transcripts. Um, and then we have another reader um, who is going to look at everything and the kitchen sink, pretty much. Um, you know, the interaction that you're having with the school, um, your application itself. Do you have any recommenders? Do you have any referrals? Then the committee. We'll sometimes we'll have a career and leadership person sitting in on our committee. Um, if there's any red flags that we see or, hey, it, here's this person's career goals. You know, knowing what we know. From the, from the career and leadership side, what is the likelihood or what are some of the chances or is this feasible? Is this, could we help them? Because it, we want to set you up for success. We won't, we do not want to set you up to fail by any means. Um, we may have the program director coming in um, to evaluate some of the applications during committee if there's any academic concerns or if we see anything that, hey, we saw this, or oh, do we have resources? Do we have tutors available? Um, we feel like this person will be successful, but you know what? They might <clears throat> struggle in this area. How can we prepare them? And again, do we have the resources? We will do them. Um, since COVID, we, we do things virtually. Um, sometimes we, we will have it in person if we're all in office, but a lot of the times we are handling things virtually just because of 
the setup for when we're all in office and when we're when we're not. Um, but it is it is a lot of fun. it's exhausting, um, but it is a lot of fun to to read the, the applicants um, profiles. OK, so you don't wear like a crown or anything like that. There's no special <laughs> music. There's I no think like the team weird would, ambiance. Yeah, we we when we are in person, we get, get a lot of snacks. So we, we <laughs> like food. So we're food motivated people. Um, so I just remember like there used to be like five six bags of popcorn, and there, there'd be like pop tarts and like you know the most unhealthy snacks. Um, but it helped us because we enjoyed it, and um, we generally love working together as a team to craft a class, but yeah, no, no wonky, you know, music, no, no crown. Although crown might be, I might have to actually ask the team if we should get crowns the next time, you know, that we're in committee and, and to wear those, but <laughs> sometimes we'll have some music um, playing, but it's more or less just to keep us motivated. Um, you know, we definitely take a lot of breaks during committee as well um, because you can get decision fatigue. And so we want to make sure that, we are all in the right mindset um, and, and taking breaks is incredibly important for, for us during that process too. I had some follow-up questions like how long, like, and, and this is just realistically for candidates, just so they understand, how long do you have to read an application, say a first read? Like, cause you can't spend, obviously you're going to spend more time for certain candidates reread and things like that. So it's not meant to say that, you know, you're not spending time with candidates, but it's really meant to just ground candidates on like how much actual time in reality you get as the leader of the admissions team to review an application. Yeah, it's not, we spend time. Um, you know, that's why it's important that each of the, the application components are strong because we're not just gonna be like, oh, there's one typo denied. We're actually gonna invest more into that. Um, it could have been an oversight. So our first readers typically can spend between about 45 minutes um, to an hour on an application, um, de and depending. Some might spend a little bit less, but you know, at least 30 minutes are spent on each application for one read. And then you have your interviewer that's going to spend time preparing for the interview. Then you have your second reader that could spend another 30 minutes on there. And then when it comes to admissions committee, I may not be reviewing every single component of the application, but I'm going through and reading all of the reader notes, reading their files, and even clicking on someone and reviewing someone. I'm like, huh, Eric, this seems you know unique that the reader one picked this up, reader two picked this up, and the interviewer, and I'm going to go back now and read it. So we spend a lot of time and invest in a lot um, when reviewing applications. Um. That's really great to like to hear. I don't think that's the same for every school. So thank you yeah. for providing that. Like that it's really different. speaks to what you all are all about. Yeah. I mean, every school is different. I've worked for an, another program that it wasn't, we didn't spend as much time into it, but I'm not saying that it was wrong. You know, pe some people are, are fast readers. Some people take their time. It all depends. But um, for, for UNC specifically, that that's our process. Um, and it's, great to have multiple people looking at the application and not just being, Hey, this one person makes the final decision and, and that's it. That's awesome. So they put the Southern charm on the application process. I can't, A little bit. that's fabulous. Um, A little bit. So when, um, so help us understand like, a little bit about the process. Just give us a high level overview. So all of these people are saying, let's say round one and it's decision day. Obviously there's some people that start early. Most don't most, you know, apply 24 hours before the deadline. Yeah. Um, do you all batch them? Like, do you have a process that goes through screens and make sure all the stuff is in there? You get a lot of questions like, hey, my recommender hasn't sent it yet. Usually there's some buffer time. So just give us a little bit of like how the process works. All of these things happen. Then a week later we go to committee and then first reads happen. And then, you know, Help us just give get a high level overview of the process. You want the secret sauce recipe? I just a little, <laughs> just a little bit of that Carolina barbecue sauce. We'd love to have some of that. We'll give a little bit. We won't give out the full recipe, but we'll give out enough. Um, so, a lot of candidates apply deadline day, similar to like when you have a car payment. When do you pay? By your due date um, and your rent due date. So that's what we see typically is when candidates apply is, is around the application deadline, 
24 or day of. Um, there is a method to our madness. Um, we process every application and we go through and make sure that all the credentials are there because we don't want to put forward an incomplete application and have a reviewer be like, okay, well, they're, you know, the recommend, recommender letter is not here. Okay, well, we want to make sure that it's all complete and processed. Um, we do invites a, typically a few days after the deadline. So if you apply before the deadline, say a month before, you're not going to get an invite until after the application deadline. And so we we wait and review all together. Um, and then we have a first read process and we have internal deadlines that we abide by um, so that we can, because it's a machine and it's a process and we want to make sure that we don't, we want to get you your decision on the application decision release day. That's you. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Um had to mute for that sneeze. Um, <laughs> well, that's awesome. So it does give insight into the process. So take your time with your application, apply when you're ready, um, because at least in the case of UNC, um, they're really going to dig into it once the actual um, deadline happens. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot here. It's going to be a little hot, so be careful. I'm ready. Um, I'm in, I live in the South. It's hot down here. It is hot. <laughs> okay, great. So if I could, you know, make you choose one factor where you would say is heavily weighted um, or maybe from your perspective, because it's a unique factor or something like that. Could you give me a factor or two where you, where you would just say, Hey, pay attention to this. We, we really look at this as part of our application process. So I don't want to say that UNC is overly weighting this factor because that may not be true, but it's something that you really pay attention to. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's, I'm feeling hot over here now. Um, that's a that's a tough question. Um, the voice, your voice is incredibly important on the application. And so the essay and the interview are going to be incredibly important. I'm not saying that we weight it more, but this is the opportunity for you to bring your application to life. As I mentioned earlier, test scores, you know, your transcripts, those are two different things. Those are set in stone. But really bringing out who you are as an individual is going to be important. And, and like I said, we'll look at the interview and put some more weight on that, typically, um, because we're also thinking about the output. You know, we're not just thinking about, oh, they're admissible, but what are their career goals? How, how will they perform in an interview with, for an internship or for um, a full-time offer? So we're, we're looking at that end of the spectrum as well. That's great. I love the theme of the voice, right? Because that also aligns with likelihood of success in business, right? Can someone really articulate who they are and bring a vision to the business world? So that's fabulous. Your job is challenging, right? Because you have to obviously bring in a great class. You have to bring in, you know, elite business, you know, future business leaders. You have to satisfy U.S. News and World Report and those other places out there. Let's be honest. And you have to make sure that all those forms that we don't want to talk about say good things about you. Um, and you have to make sure that the professors um, are happy with the candidates that you bring in. So how do you how do you balance that? Yeah, you make it sound awful. Like, <laughs> why do I I'm, do that? I'm just trying to get your, I'm just trying to get you a raise, Danielle. That's all. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, to me personally, all of that is noise. It is noise. Um, it's a distraction. It can be loud at times, but it's important that we stay true to what we do and why we make the decisions that we do and not have all of these external influences um, impacting that. Because at the end of the day, the applicant is the most important part of this process um, and we want to set them up for success. So I, I truly look at all of that as, as noise. Um, and there are days where that noise gets very, very loud and it can be just deafening and you just need to set back and those are days what you do you have to sit back as an admissions um director you have to take that step back and find that balance um and what is important what's the most important part of this and it's really it's people this is a human this is this is not a transaction people are applying and these are humans sitting behind these applications and so that's why it's important that we we are mindful of that well, now we know why you're so good on the sidelines in soccer, because you're able to 
push the noise aside and focus on the game. And, and it sounds like you do the same thing in your job um, here at UNC. So thanks for that. We have a awesome transition to myth versus reality. Yeah, oh, my maybe favorite. They'll, maybe they'll <laughs> put some noise in the background when a myth versus reality. Um, <laughs> so what we're going to do here, for those who have not joined us on the podcast before, um, we are going to kind of make statements and you're going to say myth or you're going to say uh, reality or you can say fact versus fiction, however you want to do it. Um, and then you can give a little bit of context or we're going to do um, really short um, kind of questions and responses here. So we have a few of these that we're going to go into. The first one, and this is fact versus fiction, myth versus reality. Um, you have the best chance of getting in if you apply in round one. Is that fact or is that fiction? Fiction. Fiction. Do you want me to say why? Yeah. Jump yeah. Uh, well, because if you rush the process, we're going to see that as a committee member. You know, oh, Eric applied round one, but the essay doesn't feel complete. So we always encourage candidates apply when it's the best time for you, when you feel most prepared and when you feel that your application is the strongest. Don't rush the process because you're going to risk the chance of being admitted into a program. Awesome. Um, this one may have changed. Um, you and I have seen this change quite a bit, maybe over the last uh, few years. Mm -hmm. You won't get in any scholarships unless you apply in round one, round two. That's a false. <laughs> that is false. Um it, but it also depends on the school. So, you know, for, for UNC, we do have, um, we offer fellowships in later rounds. Again, don't rush the process because you could risk not being admitted and then also not getting a fellowship. Um, and it's important to note that not all schools are going to be um, based on financial need. There are some schools, but most of the programs are merit-based fellowships. Um, and so that's just important to know going into the process and being informed about as well. But yeah, that is that is false. <laughs> awesome. Um, there's nothing you can do to get off the wait list. You just have to wait. You just have to wait. You can provide information. Um, again, each school is going to be different. But for, for us, we allow candidates to submit information um, to help strengthen their, their application while they're on the wait list as well. Um, so it doesn't hurt to ask, hey, can I submit? You know, I got a promotion. Or I retook the, the GMAT or GRE, or I got a new job offer. I did a project. I increased sales in quarter three compared to quarter two. Sell yourself. Um, and so it's important to ask the programs, if it's not included in your waitlist decision letter, what those next steps are, ask. It does not hurt. Awesome. Okay. Candidates with no quantitative analytical background will not get into business school. False. False. That is a big false. Um, we really want candidates with diverse backgrounds because they bring diversity of thought. They think about things differently. Um, you can be successful in the program. There's different things that schools offer. I know with UNC, we offer business foundations that every student has to take prior to starting the program. And it just helps you get quantitatively prepared um, for the rigors of the core curriculum. Um, so we have candidates that have come from journalism, communication backgrounds who are very successful um, upon completion of the degree. Those are things that we can teach you. Awesome. Um, this is different for every school, but an applicant needs a minimum amount of work experience to get accepted into your program. Hmm. How do I do like in between? Kind of, kind of. You know what you, you don't answer and then you give context. So go Yeah. So I would say it, it's one or the other. Um, again, it depends on the school. There are candidates that are very successful that come direct from undergrad, but it's what they did during their undergrad program. What were, what were their internships? You know, was it just going to get a cup of coffee for everybody or was it more in depth, more responsibilities? projects, um, that experiential learning side is really important. Um, were they involved in any organizations? Did they volunteer? Those are all important things that we're looking for. I've had candidates that have come direct from undergrad that were wildly successful. Now, their salary might not be where it is for an MBA, a true MBA that has a work experience, but they'll see that down the line. Um, but 
we're also looking for professionalism and maturity for candidates that might be coming with zero to one years of work experience. That was a good maybe. I like that. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so the standardized test is the most important factor in the admissions process. False. Okay. Um, they're more than just a test score. Fabulous. But. Oh, yeah. <laughs> give it to us. But, but it needs to be competitive. Um, you know, if, if you're coming in with like a, a 220G mat, well, we have to be realistic and have, you know, and think about, okay, well, is that very competitive? If the minimum score on a GMAT is 200 and you're coming in with a 220, that's, you know, yes, we're going to look for some layer of having a competitive test score. So it can't just be any score, but there are people that come in with a 600 GMAT. There are people that come in with a 590, and, but they've done things in their career um, or their academics that show that they are strong in, in um, other ways. Great. Um, the GMAT preferable to the GRE or the GRE preferable to the GMAT or? False and false. <laughs> false, okay. false. Um, take whatever you feel comfortable and most confident in doing so. Um, the, the questions for each of the tests are going to be written a little bit differently. Take the free practice test. Go, just go at it, take it, and then figure out, okay, well, which one did you feel more comfortable taking? And then that's where you want to invest your time and preparing for that one exam. Don't take both, take one and focus on that. But yeah, no, no preference. I got this one from a forum, um, so oh, it okay. has to be right. Don't even apply to the school unless you have 80%, if, unless you score within 80% of the test score and the GPA of your program. Stay off the forums, Eric. Stay off the forums. That's not true. <laughs> those are just those are just stats. I mean, when you're looking at the class profile, that's just the overall stats. There are going to be people that have above those stats. There are going to be people below those stats. Stay away from that. Um, really think about who you are and what you're going to bring to the class. But no, if you 80 to the 20 to the 80, that's just use it as a guideline. There's no guarantee. Will a low GPA prevent you from getting into a top MBA program? True or false? It depends. Another maybe. I see. Another maybe. I like to be, you know, I don't want to give you all the secret stuff, but um, it depends. Um, now, if you have a 3.0 and the average is a 3.4, that's, that's fine. Most schools are looking for out of on a US GPA as a 3.0. But there are people that come in with maybe a 2.5. Um, it's important though that they they've told their story as to why maybe they got that 2.5 gpa because of medical issues family as long as you address it and there's a story associated with it we've accepted G gpas that are below the 3.0 um, and that they have been admitted into the program and they've been extremely successful not only during the program but after the program as well so again it's important that you don't shy away like I'll give a prime example. People are like, oh, I didn't get, you know, I don't have straight A's. I'm like, well, I don't either. I got a D in a class. Um, it was uh, astronomy. I hate astronomy. I'm like, I'm never going to use this. Why am I taking this course? Got a D. And I felt like, oh, I can't sit with this D grade. Like I need, you know, I retook the class, got a C. Okay, fine. If I was sitting down writing an application, I would say, this is why I got the grade. I got a D, but I went back and retook it. I retook that class. I wasn't okay sitting with that, that D grade. So it's important that you're telling your story and using that optional essay, not just to talk about the, you know, what you think is a negative, but also celebrating some of the successes that you did. Address it. And what did you do after? Um, that's a fun fact that I'm going to keep for myself. Thank you for uh, sharing that with me. Um, mm -hmm. So astronomy is not your thing. Uh, so we'll have to remember that. Um, I know I look like I'm in my 20s, but like, is it possible like someone like me to be too old for business school? Well, that's ageism. Um, so we don't go based on age. Um, and what we're really looking for is the work experience. Um, if someone's coming in applying with, say, 20 years of work experience, um, not like you and I, because you and I just graduated from, from undergrad, um, but they have to have a serious conversation on what's the right fit? In terms of there's so many different MBA formats, there's 
working professionals, evening, weekend, there's executive MBAs. It's important to find that right fit and why you think the full time is a better fit for you compared to the others. So there are going to be some conversations that potentially will be had, you know, hey, Eric, why, why are you applying to this program? What's going to be the value add? And what are you going to get out of the MBA? Um, do you want to be in a classroom with people that have five years of work experience? Or do you want to be in a more executive with that people that have like 25 years of work experience? So um, it's important to, to look at that. But we don't we do not deny based on age. Fabulous. Yes. Um, well, here's another question. The optional essay is there, so I'm going to write it no matter what, even if I don't have anything to say. Mm, have something to say. <laughs> have something to say. Use it to use it to your to your advantage. Um, there, you you know, you have your your traditional application where we're going to ask you questions, your leadership, you know, your awards, successes, and things like that. But maybe there's something else that you want to highlight. You know, um, take advantage of that essay and but make sure that there's substance to it um, and that you're not just giving the admissions committee something to read and because that could hurt you as well. Now this is a question that you might be a little biased in because you're a top 20 program but if you don't get into a top 20 program you shouldn't go get your MBA. False. Yeah I worked for, for programs not in the top 20 and there have been candidates that have been extremely successful um, and it's what you do in your program. Um, it's a network. How do you utilize the network to, and all of those resources during the time? So you don't have to get into just a top 20 to be successful. Um, think about all of the successful people in the world right now. And success can be defined differently by depending on who you ask. So really focus on what your interests are. Um, concentration, career, cost is also wildly important that people should be thinking about when applying to programs too. Um, and where do you want to end up post MBA? Because that brand is going to be with you for the rest of your life. It's the tattoo. It you is. Don't think about that. Um, so that's a really great point. Last one, the MBA ROI is not as strong in a digital economy. I have to say false. Because with an MBA, it's versatile. There's so many things that you can do with it. You're learning about the breadth of business from accounting to finance to marketing to supply chain, leadership. Um, you know, you don't have to focus on just, you know, marketing leadership. Leadership overall is, is encompassed in an MBA program. So the ROI, regardless if it's, you know, the digital or not, MBAs are going to be, you're going to see that ROI. All right. You are off the hot seat for fact versus fiction and you're Thank back you. on another hot seat. Okay. This is rapid fire round. Cue the music. Um, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to play a game of, of rapid fire. So you're going to give me one. I might, because we're friends, let you go with more than one, but okay. you're going to give me one word when I give you a word um, that describes the phrase that I give you. I like um, this game. And you'll have to go as fast as you can. Okay. Um, so are you ready? I'm, I'm ready to win it. All right. We know you play to win. So let's see mm -hmm. how you do here. Number one, the perfect applicant. Does not exist. I'm already giving you a lot of room here. Okay. <laughs> this is a one word answer. Oh, okay. Right. Does not exist. I will, I will accept that answer okay. because it's early in the round. Okay, great. Um, that's the my warm up. The feeling of getting accepted into your dream school. Excited. Well done. Thank you. Next question. The GMAT. <laughs> Just, okay. Um, fun. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> Number four. Admission myths. Oh. <laughs> That could be the answer. <laughs> I feel like that's appropriate. Ugh. Ugh. All right. I will accept that answer. The next top 20 MBA. Goals. Excellent. 
the last and final rapid fire question. UNC Keenan Flagler. Happiness. Well done, <laughs> Danielle. Well done. What after works. after after oh. a rough start to the game and a, a quick red card, you were able to. Uh, no, no, that's not a red card. That is a yellow card. Oh, that that's a yellow because you would have been kicked out. Yeah, you, yeah. you didn't so eject you... me. So I <laughs> exactly. Okay, Fabulous. Fabulous. Okay, so um, we're wrapping up here. Um, but before we conclude, first of all, appreciate your time. Um, you gave us incredible insights. But is there anything that we haven't gotten a chance to cover today that you'd like to kind of talk about, cover in any way, shape, or form? Yeah, I just want to tell, tell candidates, apply to the program that's the best fit for them. Um, you know, imposter syndrome is going to, you're going to feel it, but don't let that overcome you. Um, definitely stay true to who you are and tell your story. That's what we want to hear. Um, and take your time. Don't, don't rush the process. Um, and be comfortable with being uncomfortable. You're going to learn a lot about yourself. It's a reflection. It's a journey of reflection um, throughout this application process. So stay true to who you are and have fun with it. Celebrate those small wins along the way. Don't celebrate until the very end when you get an admission offer. Once you hit submit, celebrate, whether that's treating yourself out to a nice dinner, going to get, you know, play golf with a friend. Celebrate those little wins along the way so that's not such a daunting um, experience. Have fun with it. Fabulous. And then is there any specific way other than the website to get in touch with you or engage with you or your team? Yeah, we have an amazing team at Keenan Flagler. I love our admissions team and we don't bias about that, but um, love them. Um, there are ways you can visit campus. We have a campus visit program that runs during the academic year. We have um, upcoming open houses. We have a diversity weekend. We're also going to be in cities near you. So um, come meet up with us, whether it's for a cup of coffee or at a fair. We're human. We, we want to help you. Don't be scared of us. Um, the team is amazing and they want to help. Fabulous. So, Danielle, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, we learned a lot from you. You are really candid and genuine as you always are. So thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you for being part of Grad Talk MBA um, podcast. Um, for those of you who uh, are listening for the first time um, or maybe you've been here um, before, make sure that you continue to follow our podcast. You can find us at Grad Talk on on TikTok um, and learn more about our MBA admissions products and services at magoosh.com. Um, and thank you so much again for, for being part of our early podcast. And we look forward to maybe having you back on sometime in the near future. As always. Well, thank you, Eric. And thank you to the team at Magoosh. Um, it's wonderful what you do and, and to provide these resources for candidates and to make them not feel alone through that process. So um, it's always a pleasure to, to see you. Thank you so much. Um, and hopefully we'll see, see you soon, not on the soccer field, um, but hopefully. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so we'll All right. You. Thanks, Danielle. Really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Grad Talk MBA by Magoosh. If you enjoyed this episode, please like or subscribe this podcast wherever you're listening and stay tuned for the next episode.